So it's a small group, um, and I think we'll do this seminar style, okay? Um, I was talking to Robin on the way down about some of the unfortunate consequences of having everything you do taped and put on the internet. It does m sort of induce you to want to read your talks and kind of make sure you've got everything right. Um, but I prefer not to do that here. You know, the chance that this particular group of people uh, will be gathered together face to face any time ever in the future is very, very small. And so I don't know what kind of intellectual capacities we have as a group, um, but I'd like to find out a little bit, and maybe there's something that we could learn together. So if you'll forgive me for sort of doing this uh, seminar style and maybe being a little bit less precise than I would be if I read it, and maybe even a little bit less coherent, uh, maybe the benefit will be that we can do some work together. My name is Gary Wolf. I'm one of the co-founders of Quantified Self. This is a picture from one of our early meetings, and uh, we're much bigger now. Uh, we have groups in more than 50 cities and more than a dozen countries, and the Bay Area group has 20-some hundred people in it, so it's quite large. But I think it still has the characteristics of our early meetings, which are uh, informal presentation of personal projects related to self-tracking and self-knowledge through numbers. We're a collaboration of users and makers of self-tracking tools, and if you have some experience with technology, technology development, you know that user groups, advanced user groups and emerging technologies are really wonderful things. And they're a place where knowledge sort of comes into being for the first time. And that's a great experience to have. Um, sitting behind me there is Seth Roberts, who's uh, uh, an inspiring self-tracker and self-experimenter. And I'm going to show you a little of Seth, Seth's work later. So I like this picture. Now, because the quantified self is an ongoing conversation about the meaning and utility of these practices, I want to just catch you up super quickly if I can. Um, was anybody here, oh, I see maybe one or two people at least, at the VLab uh, evening about quantified self that was a few months ago? Um, I'm going to kind of catch you up a little bit on what happened there and then put you right in the thick of the conversation. Um, okay. There is a dream extant in our community, and we're sort of at the epicenter of it, right here in this room, that humans can be modeled as machines, human machines. Now, this uh, dream goes under a, a bunch of different names. And by the way, I'm not talking about a metaphysical dream or conversations in philosophy, even in kind of the, the upper reaches of the academic AI community. I'm talking about a dream that's motivating technologists people who are making companies, making services, making devices. So this is a, a dream with practical consequences. Um, it goes under a bunch of different names. Sometimes you'll see it in the medical field called compliance, which means following doctor's orders. Can we sort of engineer humans and their systems so that they're more, um, so they have a smaller error rate when it comes to the tasks that we're counting on them to do as part of the medical machine. Sometimes we call it feedback which means conformity to some regulatory norm or ideal. And so people have taken these speed limit signs which tell you how fast you're going and they've made them into a metaphor for um, kind of getting humans to do all kinds of things which for one, one reason or another we feel that they ought to do. This is quite machine-like if you look at, at this device. I'm not sure we're modelable at this level of simplicity, but in any case this is the dream. And often it goes by the name of behavior change, which has this kind of ominous 50s resonance. I think people, when they, when they think in, in academic or philosophical terms, they feel that behaviorism has been sort of in a bad odor or kind of been discredited in certain ways. But often the, the habits of thought and the language that we inherited from the behaviorism of the 50s and 60s continues to um, structure the way we think, make, and communicate about technologies. So that's to kind of catch you up, to say that when I, when I ask the question, are humans machines, I, there's many possible conversations we could have, especially with some of the people here, and they're very interesting conversations, but I'm not talking about whether humans are machines on the sort of level of whether the universe is a machine or 
um, whether certain class of problems are computable or something like that. These are great conversations, but catching up in the thick of the debate, I'm really talking about Skinnerian machines. You know, this is, this is where we are. This is an active dream. Just to give you one example, um, and I choose this example not because I think it's especially inane or anything like that or to be insulting. I, I choose it because it's very typical and very well expressed. This is an actual slide made from a kind of a lead quote in a white paper by a company in the quantified self space that is helping people lose weight. And um, what they'd say in terms of helping people control their behavior or controlling other people's behavior is that the key to success is real-time dynamic personalization combined with machine learning. And, and what that is, real-time dynamic personalization means getting lots and lots of information in real time about state variables relating to individual humans, then doing a ton of machine learning so that you really understand them and can model their behavior, and then intervening in such a way that they follow directions. Okay. Um, the sensors that are available for um, doing this kind of real-time dynamic personalization are sort of compelling, and maybe one of the things that's driving this dream is a sense of the power of the sensing technology. I won't show you any slides about that. I think we'll just stipulate that accelerometers, for instance, uh, all kinds of electromechanical sensors, but the accelerometer, you know, importantly, um, facial recognition, language analysis, location tracking, let's just, let's, if it's okay, let's just stipulate that we'll get lots and lots of data about people and that that's the data that people are talking about using when they do real-time dynamic personalization combined with machine learning or modeling humans as machines. And I guarantee you, by the way, you know, if you are in a situation, an entrepreneur uh, incubator or a or a class at Stanford, or um, kind of an open innovation network, or you do some VC presentations, or anything like that, and you look at a bunch of slides, you will see equivalent, uh, an equivalent to this slide. Okay, you're caught up. This is what we mean by our humans machines. Now I'm gonna show you some examples of what we see in our user group of advanced users of self-tracking technology. And we'll come back to see if it bears on this question at all. The first one I'm going to show you is something that uh, Seth Roberts invented. I use it all the time. I call it Seth Squares. That's not his name for it. I don't think he even has a name for it. But he once told me how to be more productive. And what he told me, well, what he told me was that there's a paper that was published by somebody that he knew well, was one of his teachers at Reed College, um, Alan Nuringer, and a collaborator about quasi-reinforcement. And I'll give you, this is where I probably ought to read, but let me give you like a, a really quick sketch, and, and my apologies if I get some of the details wrong. But basically, you've got a pigeon. Pigeon are the classic animal for conditioning. You've got a pigeon, and it's pecking for food. And the food is being delivered think on a variable schedule, but it's also, it's not very, the food delivery is not very generous. Let's just use that as a fuzzy way of describing it, since I forget the exact details of the schedule. Now you use a neutral stimulus, not paired with food, okay? Just sort of every few pecks, I think it is, like a flashing light. The existence of the neutral stimulus will increase the pigeon's pecking. Okay, somehow some connection is being made. Like the food is not, the food is maybe on too long a schedule and too kind of hard to calculate maybe if it's varying in certain ways for the pigeon, but the light is helping the pigeon sort of make the connection. And, and as Seth puts it, it's like you get like twice as much work for the same salary. Okay, just through a neutral stimulus on a regular short-term basis. So Seth, yes? Is the stimulus associated with the reward? Not the light. So you've got pecking gives you the reward, right? right? So you can train a chicken to peck and you have different schedules and, right? Okay, so that's classic conditioning. And the light is flashing. The light is energy. neutral. It's not like the light goes on every time food is delivered. No, that's the whole point is that the light is a neutral stimulus, but it begins to function in some way as a reinforcer or, or it's at Nuringer and his colleague called it quasi-reinforcement. And I think there is some question about exactly how that works. And fortunately, we don't have to 
stop too long on it, but maybe it was just long enough for somebody, if they're familiar with the literature on quasi reinforcement, to explain it. I only care for one reason. That is, that Seth suggests if you're having trouble getting to work, procrastination is a human problem. You should, you, you should track your work, in a sense, in six minute intervals when you start. And give yourself some quasi reinforcement at those intervals. So what you do is you put a clock where you can see it. You have to look at it. It doesn't chime or anything like that. But you put a clock where you can see it. You're sitting there, you're procrastinating at your desk and doing all kinds of nonsense. You say, OK, I'm going to work for six minutes. And when you notice that six minutes are up, you're like, oh, I've worked for 30 seconds. Has it been six minutes? Oh, no, it's only been 30 seconds, right? When the six minutes are up, you put a dot on the piece of paper. Then you put another dot next to it, and you make a square. Then you connect the squares. Then you put two crosses through. That's 10 marks on the page. You've now worked for an hour. You've given yourself a neutral stimulus, kind of quasi-reinforcement, because you get rewards, right? There's a reward for working for an hour. That's a, that's a good reward. But working for short periods of time to get you to the hour is not very rewarding. This works so well. And if you take nothing else away from this talk, I hope I've made you more productive by giving you Seth's method. It's fantastically useful. So here's a very, very short-term sort of self-tracking, self-awareness project which has really beneficial human response. But what I want to note here is that this is Skinnerian psychology right here. Okay, So here we have humans being treated as machines and benefiting. Because we're going to go back and ask, is this the same thing that's meant in this dream or fantasy of humans being treated as machines? Or is it in some way different? So hold that. OK, um, Seth describes quasi-reinforcement, uh, the quasi-reinforcement effect as essentially a ramp that helps us do long tasks that would otherwise pay off only when completed. Okay, so it links the present with the future. Now I'll describe another project. This is one that many of you may know about. I've written about it for Wired and also one that I use personally. Um, this is uh, uh, the project that Piotr Wozniak started to operationalize the theory of spaced learning, i.e. that there's an ideal time to practice what you want to remember. You should practice what you want to remember right before you forget it. If you practice too soon, A, you waste your time, B, you may actually interfere with the production of long-term memory, and C, you just, you can't, you can't do that, right? You can't, uh, if you have, say, 10,000 vocabulary words that you want to remember, and you load too many into the present, you never get through the work, and you never accomplish the memory task. If you wait too long, you forget it. And that's a problem, too. So you want to take each thing that you want to remember. You want to keep track of whether you know it or not. And then you want to practice it just before you forget it. Now, the problem that, that Piotr found, it's also known in the literature, is that the forgetting curve is different for each object and for each person. There's not, it, it's, you know, it has a familiar shape, typical shape, but which particular curve it is, what day you're going to remember it or forget it, is not known. But with computers, you can practice on your computer, and your computer can predict the shape of the curve from through a number of trials. Okay, So this technique is encoded in a piece of software called SuperMemo. And, the, um, and it's used, now we've seen amazing talks at QS by others besides Pietro and me who use SuperMemo. It's very useful if what you're trying to do is sort of master a task that's memorization intensive. So we have a talk from QS by Roger Craig, who's the Jeopardy champion, who you know, used space learning to master Jeopardy. He crushed his competition in the Tournament of Champions, by the way, like just destroyed them. Um, we've had a good talk uh, about learning Chinese. And we've also had a really interesting talk by Stephen Jonas about memorizing trivial information in order to induce curiosity. And he was not satisfied with his sort of state of his ability to interact in intellectual cultural exchanges. He was a young person, and he decided that he would start learning things. And as his first experiment, he memorized places and capitals, which he considered himself to be somewhat trivial. And he found that simply having a sort of matrix or a framework of memorized material allowed him to do things like read the paper with more confidence, which induced him to be curious about a wider range of things, 
which boosted his sense of having something to contribute in kind of cultural exchange with his peers. Now he's memorizing art objects, the time they were created, and, their, um, and the artists. So here you have, again, memorizing things is really hard work and not very rewarding. The rewards come sort of at the end. But you have tracking something in a machine-like way, such as your forgetting curve, being used as a ramp to achieve really um, rewarding goal. OK, I'm going to talk about a completely different example now. Lindsay Mayer recently gave a talk at QS about tracking her hearing loss. She had sudden hearing loss. Um, it's very frightening, especially when that sort of thing happens when you're in your 20s. Complete loss of hearing in one ear. She described the uh, medical regime that she went through to try to unravel this. It cost many tens of thousands of dollars. But because she's sort of a quantified self, she also measured her hearing using a free audiology app on her iPhone and was able to show that the results of her self-measurement matched pretty much exactly the professional audiology exams that she was getting at several hundred dollars a pop. Moreover, she could plot the effectiveness of her treatment and decide for herself when to stop treatment, which she was getting as steroid injections, um, when she saw diminishing returns. Now, there's lots, we could do a whole talk just on this. This is sort of the medical field, because it looks like she's practicing medicine on herself. But what I think is interesting to note here is that she's not really practicing medicine the way medicine is practiced. I'm sure you're familiar with the buzz, buzzword uh, evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine means looking at population level results in order to determine treatment practices. Okay? In evidence-based medicine, what Lindsay's doing is not evidence. This is an anecdote at best, maybe a case report, if you kind of nudge it a little bit. The model of humanity in the medical field is a very complex model, a, a very big model. It involves sort of elaborate predictions about the behaviors of whole populations. And what Lindsay did is model something that is at a completely different scale than a medical model. It's at such a different scale that even the vocabulary of evidence in medicine doesn't really apply to what she did. What she did was reason about herself, using data about herself, and use that data actually critically to critically reflect on and examine the model that was presented to her by the professional modeler, i.e. the doctor, and make her own decisions. Okay, I'm going to give you one last example. And I choose the example in part because they're so different from each other. So Thomas Christensen tracked his sneezes. He wrote down, made a note, actually had an app, an, or a little just date, date, you know, um, database that had a, a form on his iPhone. Actually, I shouldn't say that he used an iPhone because I'm not positive that he did. Um, on his phone. And um, he, every time he sneezed, he noted it. Now, he had debilitating allergies, so he had a good reason to do this. And over time, over a couple of years, he did solve his allergies through experimenting and being able to know, you know when his experiments worked. And he did some neat things, like he tracked his um, tracked pollen count um, to determine whether the changes that he saw as a result of his experimentation were confounded by the amount of pollen in the air. What interests me, though, is something else that he experienced. When he began tracking his sneezes, his sneezes were experienced as less debilitating. So here you have something that's very, a sneeze is very machine-like. So in a sense, when we sneeze, we're acting like a machine. And it, you know, if you sneeze too much, it really bothers you. You're sort of trying to escape from from the machine. And by, um, by sort of asking the mechanical, by representing this mechanical process in a way that was available for, to his cognition, he changed the meaning of the sneeze and made it something that he felt that he could act upon using a different sort of component of himself. So just, we'll just kind of hold on to that for a second. So, in all of these cases, I th the, the, the thing that's interesting that they have in common 
is that they're modeling an extremely small, seemingly trivial component of the self. Whether you memorized a fact, whether you sneezed, whether you heard a tone, whether you sat in a chair for six minutes. In a sense, the dream that I spoke of earlier is not very effectively activated by any of these experiences of becoming the quantified self. And this really interests me. You have this dream of the self as a machine. You have technology that seems to be getting us closer to that dream. And then you have practices which don't use the, that same vocabulary and don't seem to act, activate that dream. Now, for a final thing for us to sort of think about before we start discussing it, I want to ask, well, does that dream ever work? You know, does the dream of kind of a effectively predicting human behavior by observing them, collecting data, and then kind of getting them to behave like a pigeon pecking the lever that you want them to peck? Does this ever really work? Because if it does work, we can ask what's special about the context in which it works um, and see to what extent that's generalizable or desirable. Well, the obvious ways that it works are in cases of addiction. Addicts are um, quite machine-like in their behavior. Um, there's um, some great research by Shepard Siegel. I won't try to um, gloss it here, but maybe just tell you to go and look at it. Um, who, who, he's described the way in which addiction um, is a learning process. And he describes, there's been a lot of work done on addicts' brains. They're very tempting, right? Because you can sort of look at what happens in a controlled context and so on like a, almost a laboratory behaviorist experiment. And you can see that these stimulus response loops or associations that addicts have are in competition to some extent with the associations that, that we think of in, in a more cognitive sense, the action outcome associations. So addicts actually become less sensitive to negative outcomes, which would you know constitute a part of learning, right? Um, because they're locked into these stimulus response loops. As uh, Siegel says, drugs have abused biased individuals toward habitual responding, specifically via the dopamine dependence, stamping in of drug-associated memories. And there's some really interesting details there about how, in a way, evolutionarily, you would expect stimulus to response <laughs> to trump action outcome because, you know, this is error detection, right? Like you have some theory about like, if I take this action, it will produce this outcome and you get some, a response that's, um, that's, that's sort of highly noticeable, um, you ought to, you ought to um, be guided, um, you know, not touch the hot coal again, you know, even if you want to move the fire. Um, I'll read you this quote from another paper that talks about the kind of competition between stimulus response and action outcome, even though it's a little technical. Uh, because the stimulus response association does not incorporate a representation of the outcome, stimulus response associations are persistent despite changes in the value of the outcome, for instance, when devalued. There's a kind of a technical way of saying that your, um, your action outcome learning is inhibited when we engage these stimulus response loops. If you behave like a machine, you're more likely to continue behaving like a machine. Okay, let's look at this in the real world. Uh, there's a beautiful book that's, it hasn't come out yet, but it's out, I mean, the galleys are out, um, uh, called Addiction by Design, Machine Gambling in Las Vegas. And I'm, I'm gonna review it for Wired and recommend to everybody that I know that they read it um, because uh, Natasha Dauschel got deeply into the design of casinos and gaming machines and into the lives of compulsive gamblers to understand how this system of manipulation of human consciousness works at, at a fine level. And one of the things I think that struck her was the uh, confidence of the designers of these systems that they could control human behavior um, one quote that's in the book from, this is a quote that she is quoting somebody in this book who's a part of the industry. The more you customize your machines to fit the player, the more they play to extinction. And play, uh, extinction is a wonderful word there because extinction is a word directly taken from the kind of Skinnerian, uh, you know, Pavlovian uh, vocabulary. Um, in this case, um, 
you can't help but think it means the exhaustion of their entire psychological and financial resource. Um, that's really the end of the game. Um, she describes the relationship between the casino and the, and the compulsive gambler, from whom, by the way, casinos derive a huge portion of their revenue. So they really are about kind of getting all the money that compulsive gamblers have um, as asymmetric interdependency. Um, and in the sense that the gambler does get something out of it. They get to operate in this sort of value-free world, this timeless world in which the rules don't apply. They get flow. And they describe this as being something that is, is irresistible. Everything is suspended for them. But it's asymmetric because the rules come back. And in fact, they are rule governed. But that rule govern, that the rules that govern them are not represented in their own consciousness. That's why you know, stimulus response associations have no representation. So th this being, having kind of existing in a world without representation, this actually is something that people seek but it has terrible consequences. Um, now, the experience of problem gamblers or compulsive gamblers and drug addicts is relevant because you can't help but look at the data that we're generating and the sort of machine-like processes that are in place to use this data towards sort of game-like ends and the market is, is quite game-like. It has tokens and you know, very abstract identities and all of the things that you want from a game. Um, that data may make us more vulnerable to being, in a sense, good subjects in a laboratory experiment. It may make us more vulnerable to relying on these kind of stimulus response associations rather than kind of the action outcome learning from which we would benefit more. Here's a really simple result. It's very well known. There's many others like it. Um, stress uh, from uh, Schwab and Wolf. Uh, stress promotes habits at the expense of goal-directed performance in humans. It was a very nice little complicated but nice little experiment they did where they sort of they got people uh, habituated to a certain reward like chocolate milk or orange juice. And then they satisfied that desire. So that devalued the outcome, right? They gave them as much chocolate milk as they wanted for a while. And people said, like, you know, I don't want any more chocolate milk and stuff like that. And then stressed subjects continued to respond as if they were being rewarded by the chocolate milk, whereas non-stressed subjects, their um, pattern of response changed. So what was happening there in the stressed subjects is that although the value of the reward had decreased, the habit persisted longer. So here you see like something that's a little scary, right? Because these devices now, many of them, uh, the data that we generate can, can show when we're stressed. We already know, okay, it's good to put ads for pizzas up late at night when depressed people or who don't have to get up in the morning are you know, more likely to feel hungry and you know, order, order them. But this, you know, stress detection and other sensing technologies take that vulnerability to a different place. Okay, now here is the, where the slide would go, where I told you what the solution was and what the answer was. How we can use, say, engagement in some of the techniques, practices, and knowledge generating culture of the quantified self to help us in a situation where the world is becoming more like a casino and where are the signals we're emitting make us more vulnerable to being treated as machines and to acting as machines. But I don't have that answer. We're part of that conversation. That's what's going on at the quantified self and I think we have plenty of time and maybe I'll just open it up here. Thank you, so let's, let's talk about it. <laughs> yes. Thank you. 
Right, and this is one of many, many, many sort of um, modeling projects that are, that are ongoing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them are just astounding. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was really interested in these points about addiction and that sort of thing. And in my own sort of research interest, I'm particularly interested in the media diet. And one thing I keep being struck by over and over is uh, we do like interviews with scholars, you know, very intelligent, directed people, and they say things like, uh, I can't read anything anymore because all I'm doing is downloading PDFs over and over. And they describe these like incredibly compulsive, like incredibly non-optimal media diets that are happening to them. That's they fascinating. Have these happening, you know? And it's like there's there's this vast realm of sort of improvement to, to be done there if you can change that behavior. Great, Robin. Actually, I was going to follow up on what he said. Oh, yeah. And, um, I, I want to know, maybe you know the answer to this. Those studies we predict people's where their location is going to be after having tracked them for a while, have any of them been done outside university campuses where people have timetables? <laughs> <laughs> no, because that's like a machine like Yeah, no, uh, the ones I've seen have been on university campuses, yeah. In a machine like environment, which has a regular thing process. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so uh, I don't disagree with any of the, the examples you gave. They're all fascinating. But I don't understand why you're pushing on this machine metaphor as though it's something new. I mean, we've had, psychology has had human, the human as machine metaphor very active for at least 50 years. And it's been very Are you a psychologist? Yeah, well, I've trained as a psychologist, yeah. yeah. And there's been lots of work. I mean, if you go to the cognitive science meeting every year, right. the, I would say that the mind as machine is the major metaphor. And there's plenty of examples where people have actually built computer programs to try and model what people have So what do you think? Do you think that that's, a, that, that, that's a, that that's the right metaphor? I, metaphors are metaphors, and, they're, and, they, and every metaphor gives you some inferences uh, for free, and that looks at, leads you down some good paths, and there's some misleading things, too. So I think it's been a very productive metaphor. But, but another point about this is that your notion of machine seems far more narrow and less flexible than the than the mechanical metaphor that cognitive scientists adopt. So you're, you, you seem to be talking mostly about, about behavior stuff, which, although the phenomena there uh, are real and useful, and certainly used in, in, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, you know, mainstream cognitive psychology is generally interested in higher level cognitive things that move above and beyond stimulus response stuff, and still adopt a mechanical metaphor. So, so again, I, 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 think that, I, I think you may be underselling potential of the quantified self and the potential of the, the machine metaphor, I think there's much more there to be had. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> well, for example, you know, language use or how people solve novel problems, how, how designers make designs. Uh, so, for example, uh, I'm, I'm involved in a project now where we're building an interactive software environment to try and help mechanical engineers uh, be more creative. How? By letting them track the, the what portions of the space they've explored, and suggested to them that maybe they should try, you know, exploring these other parts of the the, the space they haven't looked at. Now that would be that's not the kind of wearable stuff that you that you're talking about. Uh, maybe and maybe that's not appropriate for designers who are mostly sitting at a desk. But it is it is a tracking technology that could be used to increase creativity, and that's certainly not something that rats and do. Right. I think I, I appreciate that. And I think there is. Um, what would be good to get your help with, I think, is the machine metaphor. Let's just start from the beginning of what you said. This is a little bit confounding to me that the um, kind of crude mechanical language of behaviorism, which if you look at academic psychology, is um, or cognitive psychology, you know, in particular, not clinical psychology, but um, is disavowed somewhere in like the first three paragraphs of a lot of these papers. You know, it's 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 not um, naively adopted, well, so, so in but but persists. You did you get these? Most psychologists sort of, sort of back away. From right. No, that's what I'm saying. So this is what's confounding, right? Yeah. So this is something that has been explicitly disavowed, but. It continues to be it, deeply influential. It wasn't wrong. Okay? Everything, all, the, all those results in right. psychology are still valuable and useful. They tend not to be studied by psychologists because they are focusing on these, these other things. But, but that doesn't make any of the results wrong. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree that it, it wasn't wrong. And fact, right. Uh, Michael Mahoney and Carl Thornson uh -huh. had a set of research results. They, they had a whole body of literature around behavioral self-control right. in the mid-70s. And it was very useful stuff. I, I used to use it. I used right. to every week track grams of protein, sleep, hours of sleep, um, minutes of meditation, right. time on task, on graph paper, mm -hmm. like every week. Uh, and it was very useful. So I think, I think that the more that people can see themselves as an organism or a machine that is subject to complex contingencies of reinforcement, uh, the more liberated they can be. I mean, it actually. Well, here, okay. So this is we're getting a good. This is this is this is good. Okay. So here's this is the connection between say what's going on in the quantified self, mm -hmm. where you do see the liberating effects of, and I. So I focus on the Skinnerian kind of approach precisely because it's sort of it's discredited but influential in a certain way, you know. And so what you see is the most crude kind of Skinnerian stuff, like Seth Square. There's nothing more pigeon-like than Seth Squares actually has this liberating effect. At the same time, the metaphors, sort of the dreams and the fantasies of control of human beings, seem like they're part of that discredited legacy which really is, is, should, should have been sort of more honestly disavowed. And I think one of the reasons there's work to do, if something's not, on, not, not if we don't get beyond it, it's not because we don't want to get beyond it, it's because there's some piece of work. And, and so the question is, those embedded mechanical type of, uh, the, the mechanical part of ourselves, the Skinnerian self, what is that embedded in? Uh, the only problem with that is no, yeah, all of ourselves but what do you mean by that? Everything. Emotions are mechanical. How do you, what do you mean by that? What machine are you referencing when you say it's mechanical? Well, we have computer programs that, that mimic it. So a computer, you're basically saying that all of the human is basically a computer. Well, not their physical, not, not every aspect of the physical. Well, molecularly, you could say, right? When people talk about use computers to model human cognition, they're mostly talking about separate cognition and maybe some peripheral stuff. They aren't typically talking about Okay, but this is what I'm, this is the work I'm trying to do. What I've observed in the quantified self is that the benefits of these tools in practice, not, not in terms of getting a paper published in a lab, but in practice, are actually quite low level in the sense of like they're, they're not, um, and yet they're embedded in a rich personal context, which is not treated as machine-like. So while the machine-like metaphor may have, you know, tremendous, um, value in a, in, a context, in an academic context, it actually seems kind of um, uh, something else is going on here. Yeah, yeah, you know, just continue. Your yeah. inquiry yeah. about the use of the language, yeah. sort of the holdover from old time uh, yeah. behaviorism. Even B.F. Skinner took a look at this again. He wrote a book before he died called uh -huh. Upon Further Reflection. <laughs> and it was a beautiful uh -huh. piece. You know, it had yeah. a lot of things about how he managed himself in old age. Quite liberating. Right. In many yeah, yeah, yeah. Respects. And I think part of this language, the sort of taint of, right. of machine metaphor, has to do with people thinking of machines as sort of robotic, yeah. brittle, Inflexible. inflexible uh, devices or behaviors. When in fact, you know, when you see a, a beautiful ballet, uh -huh. I mean, an absolutely exquisite ballet. But that's not ballet. a machine. Well, no, it is a machine. How, it's how a, is it a it's machine? A, it's a set of biological machines prancing around okay. on stage. Okay, okay, that's, that's okay, that's fine. Those machines are different kinds of machines. Well, yes. you know, I, I, what I'm saying <laughs> is if you expand, you yeah. want to use the machine. Metaphor. But Daniel Dennett does this. That, I'm, I'm fine with that. Yeah. Basically, he says, the universe is a machine. So no, if the universe no, is a not, machine, then... It's not evolving into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a different okay, okay. I'm saying that machines can include uh, ballet performances. And when, that, when that's possible, when you can admit that, then you can see that humans as machines have a lot of degrees of freedom. So you mentioned these sort of low-level behaviors. Right. 
and they're kind of machine-like. And, right. and, yet, and yet we see ourselves embedded in a kind of a rich matrix right. with a lot of degrees of freedom. Right. Well, that's the point, that when you, when you develop really complex machines, they do have a lot of degrees of freedom, even some entropy built in and that perhaps gives us more okay, I'm creativity. This is, I, 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 I honor that vision, mm -hmm. but I, I suspect it may be, at the current time anyway, kind of a pernicious fantasy. Because what happens is that vision is taken to represent the capacities of systems that people are building now. So for instance, you have people saying, what we're going to do is we're going to, um, we're going to, um, we're going to track people's behavior at work as part of a corporate wellness program so that we can help them reach their, life, their, their personal fitness goals. <laughs> right? And that model, the model that they use to do that is very impoverished compared to the model that you just described. It's sort of a free machine ballet, right? This is a, and in fact, it's experienced as such. It's experienced as like, yeah, they're going to dock, they're going to dock me another of my insurance credits if I don't obey this machine, you know? So here you have, I think the vision that you describe is being sort of um, used as advertising well, it's <laughs> for experiences that are pretty terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, I think the, uh, in, in a sense, in your talk, you're objecting to, or coming across as objecting to the idea of a machine, uh, objecting to the idea of models, where, you know, as, as lots of people are acknowledging, those, those concepts are actually really, really broad and are perfectly valid. I think what we, you know, sort of speaking of both of us, sort of find ourselves objecting to is the simplistic models of machines that are then taken to be the truth. And you know, sort of not recognizing that these simplistic models are just simple models and nowhere near close to defining the reality. But they're sort of assumed to be true, and then all these carrots and sticks are thrown against it. So I think we're But there's also two different, I guess this is the difficult part of what it's, I struggle with it, which is why it's not completely clear. There's two things going on at two different scales. There's what's actually happening in the quantified self, which is quite mechanical, machine-like modeling at a very small scale. What makes it useful is not that it's sort of super rich or, or anything like that. It's that it's embedded in a personal context. And the context is not being modeled, right? Like, like so you really have two, say people give a talk, they give two completely different parts of the talk. One is maybe like a picture of themselves, and a sense of like, oh, they may say something, you know, about what they care about or are afraid of or wish for. And then the next thing is like a little graph about, you know, what happens to their weight after they got divorced or something like that, right? So, so you have a very simple model embedded in a rich personal context. And I think somehow the error that I'm witnessing happen in sort of the technical culture has to do with taking the, the, um, the simple model, which actually is useful, and sort of imagine running it all the way up to Neil's kind of ballet dancers, you know, in, in their minds. It's sort of like McDonald's. I remember that there's a great scene in Super Size Me, the very end, where he eats the fish sandwich. I don't know if anybody saw that movie, but it's astounding, because he, he, like, he's so sick by that point, and he, he opens the thing, and the camera goes right down on the fish sandwich, okay? And I looked at that, and I was shocked. I was like, that's not what one of those looks like. I've eaten a hundred of those. That's like a big piece of white fish, you know, sitting kind of on a smallish bun. My friend's like, no, you know, that's what the advertisement looks like. You've been eating that little turd that's on that bun like the whole time, but it's just your head has been, you've been dreaming that you've been, so this is like, I think people are dreaming of the ballet, but they're eating, you know, they're eating the corporate wellness program and the whole thing in the end is kind of going to make us sick. Yeah. Okay, so a couple things. Um, so before I came, I was like, I want to immerse myself in some Gary Wolf thinking. So I went back and read one of your old articles about Ray Kurzweil. And the last quote was awesome, which I tweeted. It's the robots of Kurzweil's dreams are complex, funny, loving machines. They are as human as he hopes to be. Yeah. So that's like just to Neil's point about like the yeah. idea of robot as not. Simplicity. Right. Like if you're around Ray, he, he aspires to an extremely rich sort of human performance. He is not, his aspirations are not robotic aspirations. And he has personal challenges like we all do. But this is like the big thing, like that like he, he wishes for 
like this yeah. this robot, this so kind of robot. Okay. So that's the yeah. second thing. So the second thing on this. So you so you describe Seth squares, right? And I use the Pomodoro technique. So like similar, yeah, yeah. Right? It's like twenty, 20 minutes, minutes is too long for me, but yeah. 25 minutes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, twenty five minutes. But so so you said like you know this crude tool, and yet it's so liberating. And so I wondered for you, like, what is it liberating from? Like, you feel liberated from your worst self, like from your less. I think that the Seth's idea of a ramp is one way to look at it. For me, I look at it as as like um, like a using these self tracking tools. Now I'll just speak personally as a self tracker. Using these self tracking tools is a way of making representations to your consciousness of these lower level processes. So. Eventually, you can sometimes you can drop them, right? Like, because you're trying to entrain new, you're trying to yeah, align your right. behavior with your goals, but your stimulus response sort of behavior it doesn't include enough representations. Like, it's just sort of your habits. Habits are not very tractable. But if you can make a link between your cognitive, sort of higher level processes and these more machine level processes, they become a little bit more tractable. And then the link. Like I've been using Robin's program, Equanimity, to program my meditation, and I actually thought the other day, you know what? Maybe I'll stop, because you know I'm now over 100 days, and it's like I'm not sure that I absolutely need to represent this habit anymore in such an explicit way. But but there are so that's I think the the answer is somewhere in that. It's somewhere in like making these links. Here, let's go to the back. What you just said is what I've been wanting to ask you. Believe that you know, consciousness is the ultimate goal. And then it's a bit of right. machines. And self, you know, tracking to the quantized self, right? It's essentially increasing a self awareness, and hence helping us become more conscious. And the reason it works, you just answered it, is because it improves our consciousness about our own self. Right. You know, if you know yourself, right? And it achieves, you know, kind of unity, enabling you to perform ballets and you know deliver performances which a machine cannot. Right. And experience emotions like love, right? Or you know, be creative and generate art and so on. Yeah. So it's you know, quantum self is a you know, step towards it's a feedback loop towards improving self awareness and hence raising your consciousness. Right. Yeah, and I think think, you know, when you speak that way, this is a hard this is a hard language to incorporate into the scientific and technical culture which underpins the quantified self. Right? Because when you talk about consciousness, you're not using a machine metaphor. There. Actually, cognitive psychology, that model is incomplete. Just like cognitive guys said, the Freudian model is incomplete. Right. So unless you incorporate consciousness into any modeling, right, you are essentially saying that you know, uh, we are just atomic dust. Right? Why does atomic dust come together and take the trouble to speak and push a question and answer? Right? You cannot explain to any model. <laughs> See, this is a just to kind of just to, to um, just to listen to that. For me, one 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 listens to another type of vocabulary of description of experience, and I do think this is a. Uh, this is important. I can, I can present this. I must you can go either way, I'm sure. I'm no, sure, but I do think it's... And I'm a you know, machine learning guy. No, no, of course. The reality mixing is my I know, but, but, yeah. but I just think it's, it's very useful to kind of underline the fact that we do have other vocabularies available to us and um, maybe, maybe useful ones, yeah. It just struck me when you presented Seth Squares um, that he extracted this method as a way of trying to create an animal Yes. Right, that's where he derived that from. But when I saw it, I haven't read the pigeon lamp flashing thing, but I've done many experiments with similar types of things, and it can be based you know, on some level, yeah. on, on something similar, which is that, and this is, this is, this is not me speaking as some kind of scientist, this is just right. a self experimenter talking about my subjective experience of the world. Um, I have trouble making progress on goals um, where there isn't something in the environment telling me how well I'm doing. Right, that's my subjective experience. If the environment isn't changing, then I don't feel like I'm making any progress. And, over, and there are all kinds of psychological consequences of that, anxiety being one of them, and you know, various other sorts of things. And I do know that that has been kind of that mechanism of there being a certain sort of, sort of problem-solving process. 
Right, you don't need reinforcement schedules or anything like that to kind of explain the effect of this, is what you're saying, which is interesting. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that it's really important for people in the AI community and the cognitive science community to be honest about where things are today and to not confuse the reductionist models that we have currently with the aspirations that you know, we were talking about before. But, but uh, clearly, we, uh, we are at a place where we can see that we are biological machines, that we do have a lot of degrees of freedom, that uh, our behavior um, is composed of complex coordination, the kind of choreography of many small behaviors. And that's why quantified self techniques that are atomistic work and it also uh, gives rise to the cognitive dissonance that you experience right. with the tremendous discrepancy between our language at the emergent level right. and our language at the kind of um, atomistic, mechanistic level. Right. But I think that I think if we're honest about where we are today, we can live with those levels and honor them in their place and, and feel some dissonance because we're not there yet at sort of modeling the higher level cognitions, and I, I think it's okay. When people say to me, well, yeah. are you saying that people are just machines? I, I say, well, they're machines, but I would take out the just. Yeah, they're wonderful, beautiful, complex. No, no, I, I'm okay. Rob and I had this conversation too coming down. Like, I, I, I put that humans, machines there because because I'm part of that, this culture too, so I know that's provocative and it kind of gets people who I like to have conversations with into the conversation, but it does have a, a, a risk, which is that um, I do think it, 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 is, um, it raises the specter of this other debate about whether things are, um, uh, whether there's a domain that is separate from cause and effect or whether everything, you know, like whether the, we live in a machine universe or, you know, so, in a way, I kind of want to leave that alone because what I see happening, especially when I stand at Stanford, right? You have no idea how many people are out there today building dynamic, real-time, um, uh, what is it, that personalization based on machine learning. And when you look at this stuff, it looks terrible. It does not, it is not going to work. In fact, you know, you, you know it's, it's um, I, I, was, I can... What did it do? Uh, we learned what kinds of routes people uh, went to take when they were driving. Or what kind of what? Routes. Built routes? Personalized in our navigation system, we built a personalized uh, destination advisor. These things work. Maybe the ones you're talking about don't work. Okay, so, but we're talking about different things. And see, that's really interesting. Like, in, you're um, talking about, and that's fine. These, that's these, were, these were recommendations, early, early recommendations. Recommendation engines totally work. Absolutely, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't work for everything, but they work for what they're made to do. And so y this is why the thing is so tempting, because people are looking at some relatively, um, I mean, the highway system is a great place to do this kind of work, right? Because you've reduced the landscape to a set of paths. And once you do that, you're golden, right? Like, and especially because you know, things like velocities and you have like, you know, you've got gates and you've got everything you need to build a system. Now you still have some chaotic things, but nonetheless, you can do a lot better than no computing on, in that kind of context. What's happening is people are importing the vision of being able to operate on these sort of constrained machine-like, nothing is more machine-like, again, than getting in a car and driving on a highway, systems into more personal and intimate dimensions of the self. For instance, 
big one is weight loss. So let's just keep on that one. This is very, you know, this is very alive. We are going to get people to lose weight through understanding what makes them gain weight and, you know, um, et cetera. I mean, if you look at, we got people to stop smoking. I mean, if you were at the V Lab, I talked about this a little bit, right? We got people to stop smoking. A, a lot of people to stop smoking, enough to make a difference in the world. We did it by taking every cigarette and putting it behind a counter, making it illegal to buy it if you were under a certain age, making it super expensive, scaring everybody to death. I mean, we did everything. Look what we had to throw at that thing. So now you have cigarettes are more complicated than highways, but they're a lot less complicated than food. You can't segregate all the food, right, you know? Yeah, but I think what yeah. Neil was saying is just that, like, it looked, I mean, yes, today, highways look simple and food and right. life look complicated, but one day, yeah, the sure. theory is that life will look like a set of highways with gates and philosophies, and, like, we'll be able to figure all that out. I mean, that's, that, like, a theory. Okay, and that's then, well said. Yeah. Does that mean that we're going to be able to predict what's stopped by and short? Colleagues, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is a conversation to have among, like, here at the epicenter in a way, is that, like, you, exactly, that you, that, that by envisioning the human as the machine, based on the current capacities of our machine world, we actually condition humans to be more machine-like, and we get into potentially very tough spot, right? Because stimulus response is going to trump action outcome. I mean, one of the hard things about action outcome for people who are making algorithms to predict human behaviors is that outcomes are open, right? That you can reevaluate the values, the value of a certain outcome changes and in an open-ended way, right? So, as, you know, we were talking about before, like, you all probably know somebody, like, I know somebody who says, like, oh, I used to be a jerk. And, you know, like, that look of shock that I used to get from people from my behavior, which used to be rewarding, is no longer rewarding to me. Now it's, like, really a turnoff. And when I see it start to come, I realize I should, I should stop being a jerk. So, so there you have like, you know, this kind of person who's changed because the value of the outcome has, has evolved. It's very hard to model kind of these open-ended shifting outcomes in some way, and yet these I, machines I, I, are reaching I, 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 in. I'm not convinced of that at all. I mean, if you get the right level of description, right? if, you, if you could describe the, the attributes that people care about, and, and, and I don't, I'm not right? figuring those out, I think it's something that we're going to have to do manually. Right. Then you can describe what people care about as some kind of a linear evaluation function, uh, as, as weights on the different. Right, areas. sure. And tracking how those, that, those weights change over time is not, should not be too hard if you can track their behavior and you got the right level of description. And all the systems we built and many other regulation systems we built, the key was hitting the right set of features. 
and, 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 the, and the right source of feedback to measure people's behavior and their choices. Once you got that, learning was rapid, things worked well. But, and I, I, I don't but do you see, does it concern that, you? That's hard. No, no, but I, I hope it's hard. I hope it's super hard. Because, because if it's easy, it suggests that you've convinced yourself that the impoverished world of your descriptions is actually the, the world that we want to live in. It's a model, and it's always going to be a model, no matter what we do. Right. So, so didn't okay. I just, sorry, I'm kind of I should just go no, okay. Didn't I just hear, I thought I just heard you say something like machines, which are things we make, right? And that even if we call the human machine, it's because we are making a machine model which gives us a, a, a predictive and But I thought you, I, I think I heard you say something like the machines that we build today are based on the values we hold today, and you know, and that we can articulate and make and explicit, we, which many things are difficult, to, as you say, to make explicit. And, yes. And, and machines will kind of. I mean, well, now this is a point which is debatable, and it's where it's interesting. Machines are. Is it the case that a machine that embodies a set of values today, will can, that same machine will continue to embody that same set of values into its own future? Or, or not, right? because if, if not, then that, I think that gets the point as well, but we're making things that embody today's values. I mean, maybe wrong about that. Let's go here and then back to Neil, and let's just keep this going a little bit more. Yeah, we have, we'll do five more minutes, yeah. Like you mentioned, that the reason recommendation in this world is because we're able to extract features, yes. we're able to measure the Well, you know, measurement is possible with machines. Human-like features cannot be measured. As an example, you know, I cannot say how much I love my wife. Either I love my wife or I don't love my wife. There's no 10%, I love her 10%, I now love her 25%. There is no such thing. Therefore, it cannot be quantized. So there are values, right, which are born in the realm of looking inwards. By making a you know, human look outwards, right? You can kill the consciousness. It never dies, but you can diminish the consciousness. Therefore, by pointing things to yourself, you want yourself by increasing the self-awareness, you are raising it, right? But the larger point that I'm making is the fundamental you know, thing that you cannot model is the consciousness itself. Because there are no quantities there. It's not a quantity, quantitative you know, artifact. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing two concerns that I think are both valid. Uh, one is that uh, people will come to believe their own reductionist models, thinking that they're not a reductionist model. They represent the, the world of real complexity. Uh -huh. human beings. And we know that happens and, every day yeah, here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. It's kind of like it's kind of like uh, struggling mightily to take a hill. Right. And what do you do when you take a hill? You build a hubcap factory or something <laughs> yeah. equally uninspiring. Yeah. And a then, monument to the fact that you've taken yeah, the hill. And then, yeah. and then the second concern, also valid, is that the technologies of potential liberation, of sort of unlocking our own behavior, learning how to unlock our own behavior, learning how to get some handle on, on self-discipline and motivation and, and uh, areas of our own bodies where we don't have good feedback loops, those technologies can also be used to imprison us by people who have other motivations, like making money and, right. and controlling us right. in various ways. Make us more so there are also yeah. the technologies for super totalitarianism. Yeah, yeah. And I think both of those concerns are real. I don't think that's a reason not to pursue the technologies, but it is a reason to raise those issues. Right. Well, this is good. Yeah. Maybe I'll just it's close on. I, I might close on this because I had a slide that I took out, which was uh, a. Uh, I'll use it in some talk because it's so beautiful. It's a quote from a letter by uh, Matthew Bolton to James Watt. So these were the partners in the new steam engine in the late 18th century that transformed you know, industry in England and eventually the world. And Bolton, they're, they're having a really hard time getting the cylinders to bore smoothly. And since the cylinders aren't boring smoothly, the seals are blowing out of their machine. And they haven't installed even the first one yet. And, uh, and uh, he, says, he says, like, I think we ought to um, to attach some kind of meter by which we can measure the changing vacuum because we need an exterior sign in order to see the uh, inner grace. 
or something like that. Okay, so he uses this radical dissenting, because these are part of this kind of dissenting, if you know kind of the history of the Protestant Revolution, these kind of dissenting culture in England, out of which also came some of these inventions of the Industrial Revolution. Also like big anti-slavery people, you know, out of which the, the kind of um, uh, anti-slavery movement arose and many uh, women's education, you know, so you have these, these kind of forces of Whig progressivism building these also these industrial engines which will become the engine of enslavement really of masses of masses of people around the world and i think it's not an accident right it's not an accident engaging in these technologies and kind of is, is engaging in the problems of the future and so you engage in both sides of the of, of those problems and so you know this i think you're exactly right that like you you have to touch them if you don't touch them you you know you don't you don't you don't get to have any kind of word. But um, something is happening in the quantified self where people are using these tools for personal reasons 